I'm here today to talk about PBM, prescription benefit management. Uh, exciting stuff, right? Everyone love that? Yeah? Yeah? All right. One thing that's interesting about Partners Rx is uh, the company was started uh, 11 years ago. And before that, we were in your shoes. We were a customer of PBM forever. And we kept asking questions of those PBMs, and we never got the answers we saw. And so we finally started our own. And I often joke, you know, we were so frustrated with PBMs, we just started our own country, I mean, our own company. Think of how extreme a measures that is. I mean, by now, we should all have started our own airline, right? <laughs> we should be flying around on mad air. It'd be great. And so then after we, we, we start a company and we kind of unveil the inner workings of the industry, we now share it with everyone we can. Because we think that information like that is much more valuable the more you share it. And if we keep it inside, it's, it's no good. It's good for us, but it's not good for our customers. And we believe the more knowledgeable everyone in this room becomes about PBM, when it comes time to choose a PBM, well, you know, the decision becomes that much more obvious. And so we have three areas that we like to, uh, to focus on. First is cost management options. Next is knowledge to make informed decisions. And last is adaptable service model. The thing with the cost management option, how familiar are you guys with your own formula? that you're on right now with your health plan? Nexium, yeah, Nexium on or off your formula? Off. Off, okay, how many other people even know? One other hand. So from the inception of part, Nexium by the way should not be on your formula. It should be excluded, it's a complete waste of money. And from the inception of Partners Rx, we've excluded and made formulary decisions like that. And in, in time, we'll show you later, has made a material impact in our trend versus our competitors. Knowledge, we do stuff like this all the time. And I think we share, Tom, I don't think would invite me up here if we didn't share things that were intriguing. And some of it, I think our competitors would, would consider industry secrets, if you will. But we don't care because we feel the more knowledgeable you are, you heard a lot of great examples with Adam. I'm gonna compliment Adam now. A lot of great examples with him. Get to know your data, he, get to know your data, he kept saying, which he's right. Get to know your data because if you don't know what's going on with the claims, you have no idea what's happening in your plan. See, because the interesting thing about PBMs, unlike medical networks, is price in our industry has been competed away. Our prices are published. They're out there for everybody. And they're AWP prices. Everyone in the industry, Express Scripts, Medco, well, one and the same, uh, Caremark CVS, Partners RX, we all start with the exact same price. And when we take off 14% from that, we all arrive at the same number. If it's a $100 drug, we take off 14%, we're all at 86 bucks. There's no two ways about it. So price has been competed away. But you wouldn't know that if you don't know what's going on in your plan. And our whole argument is, if you're in buying a commodity industry, you have to present more compelling reasons on why to buy than just price. Because we all same and sell at exactly the same price. All right, cost management options. Where do you want to be? What is the first question when someone calls you and says, I'm lost, I need directions? What's the first question you ask? Where are you? And so what this curve represents, the question marks, we're lost in the mall, we're looking at the marquee, you are here. Those are what the question marks mean. And it basically is saying, where do you want to be? Well, you can't figure out how to get there and reduce your cost if you don't know where you are currently. And what this spectrum does, which I think is pretty interesting, it's an S-curve. And it basically shows cost savings relative to member disruption. You heard the example of the Bostonian who was really upset because of the limited network. Well, the city, I believe it was a city employee, they picked the limited network because it saved them money. A limited network is a valuable tool when it comes to, to prescription benefits. But you better know how many people you're going to displace before you make that election. So is anyone in this room willing to displace 10% of their population? 20, 40, I mean seriously, anybody? I know, I know our phone starts ringing off the hook when we start hitting numbers like three or 4%. I don't know about you guys. So when you make that decision, you have to know it in light of where you are today. All right, let's talk about trend. And this is where we're really proud of. We mentioned that, and I mentioned that Nexium has never ever been on our formulary. And it, and it has shown up in our year over year cost trend numbers. Trend is an industry metric. Tom, do you report trend? in your reporting? Yeah, it's just a general, it, it's like a return on investment. It's a savings account, it's investment accounts year over year. Well, every PBM reports to CMS. 
okay? We're all familiar with who CMS is. And this is the industry trend for pharmacy benefits. There are some huge numbers out there. 11% and then you tack on 10 and a half and then you tack on six and then 13. The good news is the PBMs who reported this did it wrong. And so we're gonna completely ignore those numbers because they measure it like inflation. They use a basket of goods and during that time period from 2003 to 2006, can anyone tell me what happened to generic utilization during that period? It increased dramatically. So the way that they used to measure a trend or inflation is they take a basket of goods. And in there they had eight brand drugs and two generic drugs. And they measured how much the, the cost of those drugs increased. Well, what started happening is those eight brands became seven with three generics, then became six with four generics, et cetera. And then over a period of time, that whole basket of goods didn't increase nearly as much as they thought. So they basically were measuring it wrong. The good news is um, they did better than they thought. The bad news is we can't use those numbers to compare against. But in about 2007, they got it right. And so the way I like to think about this is, uh, anyone have certified financial planners, right? I know Optum's back. Yeah, this is the chart that they told you that your returns would be. They say, if you had invested with us over this period of time, your money would have grown this much. Drug spend is almost the same way. So if we started with $100,000 in drug spend in 2006, using average trend numbers, on an annual basis, that would have grown to $131,000 annual. Makes sense, right? Just what happens through the natural course of drugs and utilize, cost of drugs and utilization going up. Well, by comparison, there's the industry trend, here's partners are X trend. And I always like to joke, this is what your financial advisor said your investment would get you, and this is what actually happened. <laughs> right? No, no, these are year over year, these have been great. This is your return. And so on average during the same time period, our trend was about a percent and a half. Industry about four. So a percent and a half and four. The difference is that same $100,000 would have grown to only $106,000. Big difference. So it turns out one of the best things you could have done during this period of time would have been just to be a customer at Partners RX. Quite simply. All right, so about this point in time, someone always asked me about contract terms. Is anyone familiar in here with haggling a PBM over contract terms? People negotiate, and, and the problem with contract terms uh, on PBMs is people spend too much time focusing on them. They think that the discount that they get on their contract is more important than the drugs that are actually being dispensed. And so for, to illustrate this difference, what I've done is I've improved contract terms by 1% each year against the industry trend. So if they started out at 15% off of AWP in 2006, took them to 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21%, those rates are unheard of today, don't exist. That's the difference, the purple line. Kind of, what color is that? Light, what, what, what color? Purple, purple-ish, $122,000. And what this slide is trying to illustrate, it is much more important to focus on the drugs that are being dispensed than the discount applied to those drugs. If you're dispensing Nexium, on formulary, you're going to end up at 131,000. If you removed it from your formulary and offer an over-the-counter benefit where you give them a free medication if they take the over-the-counter option, you're going to get 106,000. You could spend your life negotiating contracts, you're going to end up at 122. Okay? All right. How much do plans cover? In this room, what percent of uh, medication cost do you guys cover, would you say, on average? <coughs> Zero? No. 85%, okay. What else? 100% of the, okay, how much do you plan cover? Two, 2012, on our book of business, the aggregate was about 80%. This is a histogram that shows what percentage of every drug transaction on average do our plans cover. We have some that cover 1% and we have some that cover 100%. But it always wasn't like this. When we first started, the average plan covered 68% of every drug transaction. And that has gone up to 80% in the ensuing years. You notice how there's a sawtooth fashion to this chart? Anyone guess what that's caused from? Exactly. Tell them said it. it it's deductibles resetting at the beginning of the calendar year. Okay? But so it's moved. 
So doesn't every member that we have complain that their benefits are being cut? Well, so what's happening here? This is the average benefit design. Flat dollar co-pays. 10 bucks, 25 bucks, 50 bucks. They sound familiar to anyone in this room? All right. the, on our book of business, this is the most common deductible. Well, let's take a look at the generic and brand prices over the same period. Those brand prices have kind of taken off, huh? What is the exact number? 77 to 196. Generic, I believe, 19 to 27 bucks. So let's overlay the $10 copay. So in 2002, they were paying $9. The plan was paying $9 per generic transaction. At the end of this period, they were paying 17. Hmm, okay, no big deal. But what happens when we look at the brand side? Let's overlay the $25 and $50 copay. So at the beginning, the plans were paying $27 per brand transaction, and that goes to 146. That's a big difference. And this is the impact of flat dollar copays. Anyone here use coinsurance plans on the prescription side? You don't have to worry about you don't have to worry about this. It just does it itself. But most of these prices were set, the copays, these being copays, were set when drugs cost an amount very different than they cost today. And we all know the pain of adjusting to or changing copays. Imagine having to do it every year. That would be very tough. My recommendation would be if you can do it, switch to a coinsurance plan on the prescription side. You do it once, you never have to do it. We have our plan set up that way, just a second. And sometimes I'll come out of the pharmacy paying 33 cents for a generic amoxicillin or something. It's a great way, there's a question up front. I would have to say, the question was if you have a coinsurance plan that's got an upper and lower limit, so a greater of, lesser of, so 20% or 150 bucks, whatever, the, the lesser of or greater of, however the plan is set up, you still have a similar problem because you're artificially putting a ceiling in and as the drug prices go up and past that amount, you'd still need to adjust the upper ceiling. In the end, if you did on uh, retrospectively looked at your plan over the period, you would come up with the proper coinsurance amount because even though those limits, it's some percentage that's equal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and so if you said it, it's like Ron Popeil said it and forget it, right? So if you go to coinsurance plans, you never have to reconsider this. Does anyone notice, though, what's missing from this chart? One drug category? Yeah, anyone guess what that's going to make this chart look like? Crazy, right? Huge dollars. Huge dollars. And the reason it's kind of cut off in 2009 because there wasn't enough volume in that time period to really even responsibly draw a chart, so we just cut it off to 2009. So going back to our typical plan design, of 10, 25, and 50, based on the average cost of specialty medication over that period of time, is seven times as, mount, as much as its nearest neighbor in the non-formulary brand category. So that implies that if you're going to stick with flat dollar copays, it should be 350 bucks. All right. So this is my disclaimer. I say it every time when I talk about specialty copays. I'm not telling you that this is the right number. I'm simply showing you how the math will work. And I'm telling you, as stewards of plan dollars, being responsible champion of the plan dollars, that you just need to talk and think about specialty copays. Because if you don't, a couple of ticks in utilization, and it's going to blow the plan cost out of the water, especially when they're paying at the $50 copay level. It's just become a disproportionately large share for the plan. So right now on our book, specialty utilization is about 1%. So one drug out of every 100 is especially medication. If that ticks up, which it most likely will, the plan cost is going to go through the roof. Any questions? That was pretty morbid, huh? All right. All right, let's move on to something, uh, knowledge to make informed decisions. So last year, uh, if you were here, I presented a presentation called the misrepresentations of repricings. And repricings are an exercise that our industry, the PBM industry, uses to shop PBMs. And it's a bad exercise to go through because you can mislead and manipulate the data to the point where you can get someone, anyone looking at the data, to pick the wrong PBM. It's really pretty easy to do. And as, as a company, we really struggled with it because I wasn't willing to cross that line. I wasn't willing to. Sherry's in the back, and Chris is in the back, and they're responsible for a lot of our repricings. Hi, guys. I see you back there. And so they would always ask me to be more aggressive with the repricings. 
And not that they would ever suggest that we make up data, but we'd take it as far as we could to the line. Well, other PBMs would come back and show numbers like 30 and 40% savings. It just doesn't happen. We all are comfortable that if we're shopping vendors in anything, dry cleaners, lawn maintenance, medical networks, whatever the case may be, if someone comes back with a 40% savings over what you're paying currently, you're kind of suspicious, right? Right? That's true? Yeah. And so, but my industry, what's interesting is if someone shows a 40% savings on PBM benefits, everyone buys off on it and they sell on it. And so we were really frustrated with that. So we created a tool called PRX Audit and it's available to all of our clients. And what we wanted to do with PRX Audit is first give us a tool to shoot down those, those bogus repricing exercises. Two, provide prospects some real insight into what's going on with their, their drug benefits where I don't think a lot of people get reporting like they should right now on their PBM side. And then last, we wanted to give our customers or our prospects an insight to the quality of reporting Partners RX provides relative to its competition. And so this is PRX Audit. Typically, this is a presentation I do sitting down in a smaller format, so we're gonna go through it on the, the, the big screen and do the best that we can. The data maturity model is a model that we live by in my shop, the IT shop at Partners RX. And basically what it shows is there's four stages. The first two stages are based on immature data. Who here has evaluated PBM benefits on an Excel spreadsheet? Not you, Chris. Nobody? Tom. Okay, Tom's done it. And basically you have a bunch of data, you aggregate up, and that's all you can do. You can't glean anything. Well, as an industry, and, and Adam was talking about it, the video was talking about, there's gotta be a better way. We have so many, Tom's got a ton of data. Tom's got five times as much data as we have because we only have 20% of it, and he's got the other 80 that represents medical side. But we need to move as an industry to stage three and stage four. Who here has been totally freaked out when Amazon delivers a package, the UPS guy rings the doorbell, and your phone goes off, and Amazon has shot you an email saying, did you like your new product? Right? That's kind of freaky, right? I mean, it happens right away. It's like, how do they know? And if you like this product, you'll like these 10 others. How about Facebook, right? Or LinkedIn. LinkedIn's getting as creepy as Facebook, right? Am I, you know, finding colleagues and people you didn't know. That's because they're mining the data. Google just today announced a search that if you type a search, it's going to figure out what your next search is going to be and fetch the results based on your first search. They, Google said today, that they are changing search as you know it. That's scary. That means I'm gonna wake up in the morning and Google's gonna tell me here are the 10 things you're gonna search for today. Don't bother, because we've already found them. <laughs> so, but that's stage four. That's predictive data. That's where we need to get as an industry. And audit helps you do that. And, and we have so much information, we need to use it. Okay, immature data. Does this ring a bell now? I know, I know everyone said they didn't do anything with the spreadsheet before, but this, does this, you know, nightmares coming back? Right, yeah, that's cool. Green bar, did you, did you print on green bar in the day or no? You did, massive machines that had their own room. Yeah. You do you? You can't part with, they're expensive, crazy expensive. And mature data by comparison. This, these are screenshots as this builds out as PRX audit. And this starts to format that, that drug level data into a format we're all familiar with now. Summary data on the left, insights on the right. You can take as much as you want, you can leave it, but ultimately you walk away with a clear insight to what's going on in your group. And so we're, this is what we call PRX audit. I'm gonna walk through at a high level some of the, the, the coolest parts of this thing. Key stats. Who here on the drug benefit has ever looked at a metric called ICP per day? It's a metric of the cost of prescriptions per day supply. And it normalizes across a lot of factors, mail, retail, 90-day retail, all kinds of things. This shows in for every treatment day you have, you're paying $3.64. Our book of business is $2.55. So on the first page of meaningful data of a PRX audit, you have some insight that this group is as much as 30% above where they should be on a cost factor. That's a huge amount of money. Okay, percent of claims dispensed. Who here knows what the magic number is in that? Very good, 80 is exactly it. So what's a plan cost gonna be when it's dispensing 63.7%? Terrible, they're gonna get killed. And so again, this just starts to glean more and more information. Specialty, 1.1% of the claims dispensed, one claim out of 100, 18% of their total cost. That's a big number. 
So if that goes to two, all of a sudden you're at 40% of your total spend. So two specialty out of 100, and you could go to 40% of your total prescription spend, that's a huge amount of money. Generic substitution rate. Lipitor just went generic for the first time. And so now Lipitor is classified as a drug called a multi-source brand drug. It means it has a legitimate generic equivalent, not a therapeutic switch, not moving from Lipitor to Simistatin, but Lipitor has a generic. The generic substitution rate measures how many times when a generic is available is it actually being dispensed. That number should be 100%. So that means someone in the group, whether it be a member or a prescriber, is checking either DAW1, dispenses written per the prescriber, or DAW2, dispenses written because the member requests the brand drug. It's a complete waste of money. So you need to modify your benefit design that puts a penalty in place if that should occur. You can get your brand drug if you want it, but you're going to pay the difference between the generic and the brand drug. Estimated plan design. I cannot tell you how many times we implement a new group. They tell us the co-pays, the plan goes live, and then they subsequently come back and say, we had it wrong. Those aren't the co-pays on our plan, and can we change them? And so what's neat about PRX Audit is we're starting to use it internally as well. We're using it to make sure our implementations go seamlessly, and it ferrets out information. Right off the bat, I noticed that their retail generic copay at 10 bucks and a two and a half times copay at mail. That's the magic number PBMs have told you forever. I'm telling you that's costing you money. As a plan sponsor, every script that goes through mail, it's costing you money, and I'll show it to you later. It should be 2.9 or three times. So basically the same copay that's at retail. See, the, the, the myth has been that the reduction in cost at mail order is sufficient enough to offset the lost copay dollars coming from the member. It doesn't happen. Mail order should be a convenience not a cost savings tool, okay? By the by, that's where all of the PBMs make their money, mail order. Other area of concern, you'll notice here that on the, the formulary brand side, the mail, it's paying $63 per transaction. That's the same, same copay that specialty is paid at. So you've got specialty medications that are pricing at your second tier. And I think we showed earlier what's gonna happen to your cost when that occurs. Okay. Here's how we get the copays. I'm going to show you a little bit how we drive it. On every brand transaction, you can model out that on an average brand transaction, the member will pay $34.92. The modeling software will highlight in blue any significant amounts of copay. The first blip you see is $25, and the second one is $40. And so that's how we assume the first tier brand copay is $25, and the second one is $40. All right, here we go with discounts. Generic discount, 68.6. Has anyone negotiated generic? Never mind. Generic discounts at 68.6% .6 are terrible. They're really, really poor in this industry. Right now, Sherry, Chris, what are we quoting? Generic effective rates? 70 to 76. Okay, 70 to 76. That doesn't seem like a lot, but that's a lot of money sitting in that pool. What, what you could tell off of this is 14.7, Chris, is a very competitive rate right now on the brand side, correct? And so when you spreadsheet and model PBMs, people focus on the 80% cost, and that's on the brand medication side. And the discounts are really easy to factor, so everyone negotiates against that. So they, they pushed really, really hard for a very competitive brand rate, and the PBM said, fine, we'll give it to you, but we're going to take it back on the generic side. And so they're taking it out of one pocket and put it in the other. The other thing you'll notice, remember how the mail copays were set up? at two and a half times, so you'd expect an inc increase in discount on the mail side on the generics, they're at the same rate. Plan's getting crushed on those. That's where the PBM's making all their money. Retail brand discounts, 14.7%. You can see how clean this is. All the brand drugs process about just over 4,000, right at the 14.7%. That's that, but you also see another blip there. That's probably a 90-day at retail. And we'll see later in the network section of the report if that ferrets out. All right, here we go on the retail. 690 pharmacies. I would not suggest that you use a limited network, a limited pharmacy network, and a plan that uses 690 pharmacies in 41 chains. 
unless you're going to change your phone number and email address after you implement that change. <laughs> Limited network lightly and retail at 90 is yes. The top pharmacy is Walgreens. Here is the, the chart name is a Pareto chart. It shows the member concentration at chains. So right now, if you implemented a limited network, let's say had Walgreens, that would be 39% of your retail volume and you picked up um, Target at another 5%. So you have 44% of your retail volume. All other chains were excluded. Would anyone be willing to displace 56% of their retail claims to save a couple of points on the pharmacy side? That's good, and I'm happy you said that. That's great. And so long as you know, but if you make that decision and there's other PBMs that push, push limited networks all the time, limited networks are a legitimate cost savings tool. No doubt about it. I'm just pointing this out so no one makes that decision without knowing that a huge number of their members potentially could be displaced. And if you're willing to do that, awesome, because you're going to save the money. We figure that any time that the top two chains equate to about 65% of the concentration, we flag it as limited. This just happens to be right on the D mark of that number. Top 10 chains represent 95% of all their business. Okay? And then within the chains, and I was actually kind of surprised to find this out, that discounts vary within a given chain. You could see that the brand side is all pegged completely at 14.7, but the generic discounts move all over the place. The fallacy though, what's the number one chance? Sam's, Sam's Club. We'll drive everyone to Sam's Club. The problem is I believe Sam's Club is 1% of total claims volume. And so as more and more people go to Sam's Club, that discount will normalize to 68%. But what's really cool about this report, instead of drug benefits being an afterthought, now you can sit down and glean some insights to what's going on with how your group is performing. And frankly, I think a lot of this information will give you information on what's going on in the medical side as well. And then uh, lastly, we call this the vacation chart. And to be completely honest, I put it in there because I thought it was filler, because I thought we needed a few more pages to the report. And it turns out to be one of the neatest reports because it substantiates the findings. People see it and go, yeah, we are based in Florida. And yeah, I remember, you know, Jane went up to New York and got sick, and that's that script that's filled, and so all of a sudden it substantiates the report. And then who, whatever the number one state is, we do a county breakdown, and you can see that this company is, is clearly based in Hillsborough County, of course, right? So that's PRX audit. Uh, very quickly, there's a lot more we could do with PBM data, and when you're a customer of ours, we highlight all that stuff. But on the prospect side, remember, these are for people who aren't our customers yet, we offer this, that we had to keep the data set very limited. I noticed we have a handout back there on our, on our booth. We're the one with the, the big head. I said we're starting to look like Easter Island, you know. <laughs> so the big head points to the handout on PRX Audit. If you're interested, you get to read some more and some limited data requirements. So any questions about anything? Stories about my dating life. Uh, <laughs> anything you want me to cover? Okay, sorry, I, I misspoke. I, you know, I, in my world, it's black and white. In Sherry's world, it's a whole bunch of gray. <laughs> Nexium has never been on our standard formula. That is correct. Sherry is also correct in saying that some people probably, and I'm guessing by her response, some people in this room probably have elected to keep Nexium on the formula. That's fine. It's just a, we don't care what decision you make. We just want you to make it in light of how, what it's going to do to your cost or member disruption. So the election to keep Nexium on the formulary was as a result to minimize member disruption. Totally good with that. OK if you want to do it, so long as everyone understands how it will impact cost and disruption. Sorry, Sherry. All right. Chris, do you have to read Is there anything I need to correct? There, are we OK? Kristen, we're good? All right. All right. All right. All right, so I, I got us a little bit back on top. Yeah, question? Sure. The, the question for the rest of the room was, at what copay level does it start impacting compliance and people choosing not to take the, the specialty medication versus taking the ultimate end cost? It's a great question. It depends on the group. And, and my intention today was not to show that 350 bucks is the optimal copay for specialty medications. My intent today was to say it's something you need to talk about. I think it depends. I just think it needs to be discussed. A Kaiser study, 
And I'm a little bit iffy on Kaiser studies, uh, but a Kaiser study said the magic point was $172. I don't agree with that. I think in some plans it's less, and in other plans it's more. The trouble I have with that, though, is if you don't constantly talk about it and pick the right copay level, ultimately the plan is going to have to elect more radical measures in terms of managing their costs. Because plan sponsor dollars, they're a finite resource, like everything is, and it has to be managed. So there's not a magic number. It takes some analysis, some thought, some willingness of risk, and then you have to go from there. I will tell you that I didn't bring it in just a second. I didn't bring a slide today with me that shows that member behavior does change based on copay levels with specialty dollars. Something like 98% of our plans in our book have a specialty copay that on a percentage basis, the member pays less on a percentage basis than they do for all other classes of drugs. And in those cases, 50% uh, of the time, so right on the average, their costs were above and below the mean. On the 2% where they shared at or more, they had below average specialty spend. So clearly the members are making an economic decision. That's, uh, there was a question, just I'll come back, yeah. In, in my, where the question was, was in two, the big names off. yeah, in 2000, and it was right about 2010, 2011, the brand inflation shot up like a rocket. And in the presentation I did last year for Lipitor, there's a, a, a span of 18 months in that period where Lipitor increased by 40%. And what's crazy about that. What's crazy about that is Lipitor on a claims volume and a dollar volume was by far one of the highest dispensed, most expensive drugs. So you take the most expensive segment of your drug use, excluding specialty, and you increase it by 40%. That's exactly what you were seeing. We thought it was a patent expiration thing. You know, because they, they, they would have to be more discreet about passing through dollars that they owed to IRS. So it was a patent expiration. They're going to get their money. They're just going to increase. And that's happening more and more and more in the cliff. They're getting more aggressive about it, and they're raising prices significantly. There was a question. All right, I want to I get to that because it's a cra it is a crazy. The, the rate of inflation, the data is, uh, and there we are. Uh, I don't know. That chart frightens me, and I kind of don't care what, if the rate of inflation is, you know, 40 percent or 80 percent. But it's it's going crazy. Uh, I fully expect in our industry there. Everyone's heard of biosimilars, so specialty medications are in a weird category. They're the new brand drug. Brand drugs have become passe. They've become too exposed, too controlled, and the new brand drug for pharmaceutical companies are specialty medications. And what will start to happen, and we need competition in this, we need, we need the FDA to get off whatever they're sitting on and start approving these drugs to get biosimilars. Otherwise, that's going to go to the point where people can't afford it. And what they're, what they're doing here, and from a pure economic standpoint, is finding the pain threshold for these specialty medications. For example, the one that I struggle with is Embrel, Chris, for the arthritis. Our arthritis has been around a little bit longer than the last four or five years, right? Right? And, and Embrel costs 22 to 2,500 uh, a month. And our pharmacist, Dick Buller, who some of you may know, told me not too long ago that that was a $700 drug before they had to start paying you know, Phil Mickelson. But it was a $700 drug for a 30-day supply. And the rate of inflation on that drug is, is through the roof. Well, as a plan design, you know, my grandfather struggled with arthritis horribly. And he didn't have Embrel to use, but he found a way to live his life. And, I, and unfortunately, we're put in a position where we're all going to have to start making decisions like that. And it's a quality of life decision, and it's, it, it's a tough one. And, and that's where they're fearing it. They're price discriminating to say, to the point where, are you going to live with arthritis, with drinking a lot of water and taking your aspirin, or do you want a more aggressive treatment? Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm going to try to summarize it. That was a very broad question because the first one was the lifestyle drugs. Uh, just, just to make sure, I see Alice Viagra. Is that what you mean by that? Okay. Just want to make sure we're on the same page. And then the yeah. Okay. And then the next question was the, the other big point in there was are brand drugs as effective as their generic equivalents? 
Okay, so we get another couple hours. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Three three minutes. Uh, the lifestyle drugs, are ones that have no other medical purpose other than to improve life, we feel it's a plan sponsored decision, and it's a benefit as was stated earlier today. And if you want to cover them, great. If you want to exclude them, great. We don't care. I will tell you that other PBMs want them included because the rebate dollars associated with them. Do you know what I found out the other day, just real quick? Nexium pays a $55 rebate, Chris, is that right? I heard that the other day, it blew me away. That's crazy. $175 drug pays a $55, anyway. And the other point was um, about the brand medications and generic equivalents. I, that's a complete farce, in, in my opinion. The, the generic medication is fine. If anything that attests to the placebo effect of medications, <coughs> I know when I'm sick and I finally convince the prescriber to give me antibiotics, I feel better before I even have filled the script. <laughs> My body knows those antibiotics are coming and I'm getting healthy. So. How about compounding? Compounding meaning just joining drugs into, um, compounding at the pharmacy or compounding at the pharmaceutical company? Usually at the pharmacy. Okay. Because um, I, I was going to speak to the pharmaceutical company. It, it, compounding at the pharmacy is a pharmacy trying to find a way to charge more dispense fees and get reimbursed for more medications. Is it really going to help you taking out of two bottles or one? Maybe if you're more compliant taking a single pill every day, okay, and then it's a compliance argument. Compounding at the pharmaceutical companies happens because they're trying to extend patent expirations. That's why you went from Claritin to Claritin D, to all other distribution because they get another extended period of time because they change the vehicle with which the drug's being dispensed. I think I got time for one more. Okay, I'll be around. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah, there you go.